Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with our module in heat transfer. Uh, we are busy with chapter 6 on internal forced convection. And with the previous lecture, I've showed you very quickly, without going in too much detail, how this equation was derived. A very well-known fluid mechanics equation, almost from first principles, which gives us the thickness of the velocity boundary layer. And then there was also an equation for the thermal boundary layer, but connecting this to is the pronal number, and we've also discussed the pronal number and what it means. Now I would like to do an example to make this more clear and to show you how we connect the velocity boundary layer with the thermal boundary layer. So the problem we are going to do is air at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. Now in the tests and exams, I'm just going to give you, give you that. The air 20 degrees Celsius and a velocity of 1 meters per second. You need to know your textbook very well in terms of the tables, where you're going to get certain information. With your tables, there are especially two tables which are more important, most probably, than the rest. And that is the table for air and the other one for water, because we as engineers work a lot with those two mediums. So, if you go and look in table A15 at the temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, then you'll find that the pronal number is 0 0.7309. So maybe I should have put this table there after the velocity. So the pronal number is 0 0.7309. So order of magnitude of pronal number is 1. The density of air about, as we know, 1 kilograms per cubic meter, and the viscosity of air at 20 degrees Celsius is 1 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5. So those are the properties, and that is unfortunately some of the irritations that go with this module in heat transfer, is that you always need to take the properties in co into consideration. So with this problem, we are now going to work out the boundary layer thickness and the thermal boundary layer thickness. That is what has to be determined. Now looking at this equation, we can see that we need the Reynolds number. And it's at Reynolds x, why is it x? I'm going to show you just now. So at x equal to one meters, okay, yeah. And sorry, this has been asked to determine where x is equal to one meters and where it is, e sorry, 0.5 meters, 500 millimeters, 0.5. And at one meters from the leading edge of the plate. So let's start with x equal to 0 0.5 meters. My apologies. Like that. Then we can say the Reynolds number x is equal to rho vx divided by the viscosity. So x is the distance from the leading edge of the plane, of the of the flat plane. Same with an aeroplane airfoil, we always use the leading edge from the, from, the, from the tip. Okay, so the density is 1, the velocity is 1, x is equal to 0.5, and the viscosity is 1 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5, so this Reynolds number works out as 500,000. Oh, sorry, 50,000. Fifty thousand. And going back to the lecture of yesterday, we said that transition for flat plate is approximately at 500,000 to 1 million. So we can see it means the flow is going to be laminar. And this has been derived specifically by making the assumption it's laminar flow. So that would be for x equal to 0.5. Let's also calculate the Reynolds number for the case where x is equal to 1. So therefore, Re, the Reynolds number, is rho vx divided by the viscosity. The density is 1, the velocity is 1. 
but now x is equal to 1 multiplied by 1 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5, so that would give us 100,000 for the Reynolds number. So the thing to notice is it is what we call the local Reynolds number. So there, x equal to 0.5, and at this point also x, but now equal to 1 meters from the leading edge. If we would now go and consider the boundary layer thickness, where x is equal to 0.5, then it is equal to 4.91 divided by the square root of the Reynolds number x. Okay. And that is equal to 4.91 divided by the square root of 50,000 which works out as 0 0.01098 meters, which is 10.9 millimeters. Okay, so this is the boundary layer thickness at 0.5 meters from the leading edge. Let's do the same where it is now 1 meters from the leading edge. Again, it is equal to 4.91 divided by the square root of Reynolds x. It's equal to 4.91. The substitution of Reynolds x is 100,000. And this works out as 15.53 millimeters. Zero point? Zero and in millimeters? Zero okay, so yeah. this one, you, you get how many millimeters? Um, so I get two. Uh, two. Sorry, two. Twenty-one, did I hear twenty-one? Okay, so twenty-one millimeters. Sorry, and this one is? No, it can't be right. Uh, I get what you get. He, he, he's getting what I get. Is it right? Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, so this is 10.9 millimeters, and this is 15.5. Uh, does it matter what the exact values are? Um, for the sigma x is equal to 4.91x. Oh, did I forget the x here? Yeah. OK. Like that? OK. So x is 0 0.5, and that should be 1. OK, is the answer still right? Oh, the answers are still right. So you see it is there. It was there all the time. Okay. Right. Now, let's just look at, and I'm trying to, going to do it according to scale because I'm doing this to give you a, a physical feeling for a typical problem with a boundary layer. And these are problems that we as engineers and scholars see a lot. So a velocity of about one meters per second, maybe over the roof of your house or the fuselage of an aeroplane, if I'm not mistaken, that is about 3.4 kilometers per hour. So one meters in a second is you travel that distance in a second. 
So it's not that fast, but something is moving. So we've got a few dimensions here. Let's suppose that is about 1 meters, and that is about 0.5 meters. So there's x equals 0, that is 0.5, and there, that is about one, 1 meters. Okay, so at this point here, the local Reynolds number is equal to 0. Okay, why? Because x is equal to 0. So the local Reynolds number is 0. At this point here, it is equal to 50,000. And at this point, it is equal to 100,000. So the Reynolds number is increasing from with length. And I'm going to draw in now mm. the boundary layer thickness, and I'm going to try to do it according to scale. So 0.5 meters is about 10 millimeters. That's going to be about the boundary layer thickness. At 1 meters, it's going to be 15.5. So it's not that it, dub it doubles. So th that distance there, the boundary layer thickness, is equal to 10.9 millimeters. And there, the boundary layer thickness is 15.5 millimeters. Just to give you a feeling for these values, a physical feeling. Right, so that is the boundary layer thickness, but we must also calculate the thermal boundary layer thickness. And for that, we can make use of this correlation that says delta, the boundary layer thickness divided by the thermal boundary layer thickness is equal to prandtl to a third, or approximately equal to it. And if we now go and calculate at x equal to 0.5, by looking at delta divided by delta t is equal to prandtl to a third. And we do the substitution, then it is equal to 10 0.982 millimeters, so it's 0.01098, divided by the thermal boundary layer thickness is equal to the Pranel number, and the Pranel number is equal to 0.7309, and that is then to the third, and the result is that the thermal boundary layer thickness is 12.9 millimeters. One nine millimeters. Okay. So this is for x equal to 0 0.5. Let's also calculate it for at x equal to 1. Again, boundary layer thickness divided by the thermal boundary layer thickness is equal to a pronal to a third. You're going to see the pronal to the third a lot in many equations, or approximately. And now, the thermal bound, uh, the boundary layer thickness is 15.5, divided by the thermal boundary layer thickness. That is equal to the Pranel number again, which is 0.7309 to the third from which we can solve the thermal boundary layer thickness as 17.24 millimeters. So let's draw this in with red to show the thermal boundary layer thickness at x equal to 0.5 it's 12.19, so it's about there. And this one is 
thermal boundary layer thickness there. And there it is equal to 12.19 millimeters. And you will remember yesterday I showed you that if the pronal numbers are the same, the two lines will collapse on each other. If the pronal numbers are large, smaller than one, then it will be on this side. And if it is <coughs> larger than one, it diffuses it much quicker, and then it will be lower than that one. So, if we now try to show, according to scale, what is happening with the velocities, if that is now the one meters per second velocity, then it means that from this point onwards, going up, the velocities will all be one meters per second. They should be arrows because they are vectors. And everything below it will reduce us to zero. That is the velocity boundary layer. And in a similar way, we're going to get the thermal boundary layer. Everything higher than that point will have the same temperature, while everything lower than that will have a temperature gradient. You follow? Any questions? OK. Paragraph 6.9. This is routine work, and that is a paragraph on non-dimensionalized convection equations and similarity. So what it does in this paragraph, it looks at the continuity equation, the momentum equation, and the energy equation. And as you've done before, what is being done in this chapter is that all the variables are being non-dimensionalized. So x star is equal to x divided by L. The same with y, non-dimensionalized. The temperature is non-dimensionalized by saying it's the temperature minus Ts divided by T infinite minus Ts. And the pressure is non-dimensionalized with the pressure divided by rho v squared. Things like that. The details of all of it is not so important. But if all these this can be substituted in the three equations, then we end up with something that's very important, and that is that everything can be non-dimensionalized to the Reynolds number, which is the velocity multiplied by the characteristic length divided by the kinematic viscosity, or you can write it as the density VL divided by the kinematic viscosity, and of course the pronal number, which is equal to the kinematic viscosity divided by alpha, is equal to CP the viscosity divided by K, and these become what we call similarity variables. Similarity variables. Now, these are very important because, as I've mentioned before, Although we've got solutions for very simple geometries like flat plates, the moment the geometry starts becoming more general, those equations do not work. We cannot use the analytical equations for that. And nobody has won the Fields Medal yet for solving the Navier-Stokes equation analytically. Therefore, we have to do some experiments. And if you do experiments, you end up with a situation where if you're interested in the drag or the heat transfer, the number of variables that you have to consider are a huge number. It is the density of the fluid. It's the viscosity. Uh, 
the, the velocity, the viscosity, the CP value, the thermal conductivity value, a large number of variables. And it's physically impossible to go and do experiments for every possible solution and to put it into an equation or a table or anything like that. So engineers has, for a long, has already known for a long time that if you would, for example, consider um, a submarine and a real submarine in terms of length is very long. I mean, it can be, I don't know, 100 meters or something like that. And if that is your submarine and that has to operate at a certain velocity underneath the water, so it is going to be water around it, and it's going to operate in an environment where the sea temperatures are very low, zero degrees or lower than zero. And of course, there is going to be heat transfer. Okay, that's the first thing. And the other thing is there's going to be drag on the submarine. So you need a propulsion system that can move it forward. And also, with this propulsion system, properties of the water and the temperature of the water is going to play a huge influence. So how can you, before the time, predict what the, what the thrust is going to be and what the heat transfer is going to be? Because if you know what is the heat transfer, for example, you can put in some insulation and or you can put in a heating, ventilation and air conditioning system, making sure you provide enough heat for the sailors in the submarine. For the thrust, you need to know what should be the size of the engine you must put in for a certain velocity of the submarine. So what did they do? Well, you can go and do water tunnel experiments, and you can decide, I'm going to build a scale model which is only one meter in length, a length one. And I'm going to operate this maybe with oil. And that oil is going to be at a certain temperature. T temperature T. And can I then, if I get the drag of that thing and if I determine the heat transfer, how can I relate it to what is going to happen in the real physical situation. If your scale model is 1 meters and this is 100 meters, does it mean you must multiply your answer with a 100? Well, the laws of similarity says that, well, before you do your experiments, you first need to go and do some homework. And with that homework, it's very important that you determine this Reynolds number, which is Reynolds number 2. And this Reynolds number and that Reynolds number should be the same. Okay? So if this Reynolds number is, for example, 100,000, then that Reynolds number must also be 100,000. Now, to get a Reynolds number to be the same, what are the things that you can control? You can control the properties of the fluid. You can control the velocity in the tank. And of course the size, but once you've decided one meters, then you must go and determine the others. So if you make sure that the two Reynolds numbers are exactly the same, then the laws of nature tells us that the drag force is going to be in the same ratio. And the same with the Nusselt numbers, or the Pronal numbers. So if we make sure that this Pronal number one is equal to Pronal number two, so this should be equal and that should be equal. If, that's, if those are the cases, then there will be a direct relationship between the drag, mm, let's, let me rather write it, write it like that. So then there will be a direct relationship between this force and this force. And the same with the heat transfer rate. 
This heat transfer rate is going to be a certain function uh, where those two heat transfers are related, but that is only if the Reynolds numbers of 1 is equal to the Reynolds number of 2, the Pranel of 1 is equal to Pranel of 2. So if you can manage your experiments by choosing very carefully, you can actually make sure that if you go and do the experiments on this body, then there's going to be a certain function. And the function might be a linear line or it might be an exponential function or whatever it is. But the moment you have that function, you know that function will also be valid on the large scale body. You all know this from fluid mechanics, am I right? Yeah. So the only thing that is being added is the heat transfer. Paragraph 6.10 is also one that looks at the functional forms of the friction and convection coefficients. So what I've explained here is actually now valid in paragraph 6.10. And the very important conclusion that is then being made is that CF, which is the skin friction coefficient, is one or other function, let's call it F4, of the Reynolds number only. And so this F and that F is related just in a non-dimensionalized form. And this E transfer is related to the Nusselt number directly. So that is equal to a function G4 of not only Reynolds number, but also Prandtl number. The conclusion at the end of all this mathematics is that the Nusselt number in general can be written as the Reynolds function to the N, Prandtl to the N, and this is extremely important. Everywhere in internal force convection, you're going, to rec you're going to see this, this type of function. Now, it is correct, but it's not completely correct in your textbook. Because later on, you're going to see that there's another one that should be added. And that is actually the Grassoff number to the power of zero. Or let's make it a P so that it doesn't look like zero. Now that will become clearer in two or three chapters from now when you're going to look at the effect of buoyancy. Right. Now one of my favorite parts of this textbook or in the general field of heat transfer is paragraph 6.11 which is the analogies between momentum and heat transfer. So I'm going to finish paragraph 6.11 with an example. And then the next one, 6.12, if we can call it that paragraph, is not in your textbook. Okay, so there we are going to look at some additional new material that has been published. So in terms of the analogies, <coughs> we there's a derivation that's going to be shown for the very special case of Brownell number equal to 1. So if we go back to all these values that are non-dimensionalized, you're going to get the case where the Brownell number is equal to 1, and then the differential equations becomes much easier to solve. So for that very special case, it will be solved, or it will be shown that CFx so the skin friction coefficient divided by 2 is equal to the thermal boundary layer thickness, and that is equal to the Nusselt number divided by the Reynolds number divided by the Pranel number. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Not that one. Not thermal boundary layer, the Stanton number. The Stanton number, so it's a new non-dimensionalized group, 
group that shows Nusselt number, Reynolds and Parandel as one variable altogether. Now this just looks like another equation, and yes it is. But if you look carefully at it, it means that nature are telling you that what happens in momentum with Newton's law happens also in heat transfer. So where we look at the continuity equation, the momentum equation, and the energy equation as three equations, it shows that these things are connected in nature. Take note, this is for Prandtl number equal to one, and it's only for laminar flow. Now, Prandtl number equal to one, if we look typically at air, the Prandtl number of air is 0 0.7309. So it's close to one, but not one yet. Okay. So depending on the temperature, if you change the temperature, you can get to Prandtl numbers of equal to one. But as a first assumption, we can say, yes, it's approximately equal to one, and then we can actually use this very simple equation that gives us this analogy between forces and heat transfer. Chilton and Colburn, they put in a lot of work in which they showed well, that we can also get a solution for pronal numbers not equal to one, but for pronal numbers larger than 0.6. 0.6 and I think up to uh, pronal numbers of 60. And they've, they have, they've developed this equation that is known as the modified Reynolds analogy equation. So that's the Reynolds analogy or the chilton colburn analogy. And this analogy says the skin friction value multiplied by the Reynolds number divided by 2 is equal to the Nusselt number x pronal to the third, or minus a third, or you can also write it as the skin friction factor divided by 2 is equal to the Stante number at point x, the local value, multiplied by pronal to the two-thirds and that is also known as the J factor. Now if you look at these equations, you will not really appreciate it. But let, let me give you an example that will give you a better, a better appreciation of this real brilliant work that was done. Okay. And this work says, and I'm going to show it now with a good example, let's suppose you've got a flat plate. And the dimensions of this flat plate is 3 meters by 2 meters. Okay. And you hang it on a tree and you put a scale there so that you can measure the force. And let's suppose it says 1 Newton. And then you put a fan here so that you can increase this velocity to 7 meters per second. Okay, now, now let's suppose it was uh, 10 newtons, the force. And now, with 7 meters per second, the force is less. So the difference between the two forces, the two measurements, is a drag of 0.68 newtons. So the weight has been taken off in terms of the net force on this plate, 0.86 newtons. And we are working with air, so the properties of air, and we can assume at one atmosphere, and table A15, that is where you can go and get the properties. And for air, you're going to get that the density is equal to 1.204, kilograms per cubic meters, Cp is equal to 1.007 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin or degree Celsius, 
The Pranal number is equal to 0 0.7309. Thermal conductivity K is equal to 0 0.02514 watts per meter Kelvin. And the viscosity of the air is 1.802 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5 kilograms per meter second. All of you would know how to get the skin friction coefficient from fluid mechanics. So from fluid mechanics, you know that the force is equal to the skin friction coefficient multiplied by the surface area multiplied by rho v squared divided by 2. The same as getting the drag force on an aerofoil. You need to get this coefficient. Now, in this case, we do an experiment, and we, and we actually get the coefficient from measurements. So the force is 0 0.86. The coefficient is what we want to calculate. What is the surface area? The surface area is 3 multiplied by 2, but remember... There are two surfaces. There's the one at the front and there's the one at the back. So it's multiplied by 2. So it's not 6 square meters, it's 12 square meters for the front and the back. The density is equal to 1.204. The velocity is 7 meters, 7 square, divided by 2. So the drag coefficient the skin friction coefficient would then be equal to 0 0.00243. Okay. So now, let's just imagine the beginning of the year. Somebody has asked you, for this flat plate, what will the heat transfer be? But these are the only experiments you are allowed to do. Just normal fluid mechanic experiments, the velocities and the forces. If you think of it, you would say, but that can't be. If you know this, how can you get the heat transfer from it? And that is exactly what this analogy tells us. It tells us if you've got the one, you can actually get the other one. So you do not have to do the heat transfer experiments. Okay. So let's look at this analogy. But before we do that, let's just calculate the Reynolds number. Rho VL divided by the viscosity. 1.204 multiplied by 7. The length of the plate is 3 divided by the viscosity 1.802 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5. And the Reynolds number is going to be 1.403 multiplied by 10 to the 6. which is close to turbulent flow, which is close to turbulent flow if it is not turbulent. However, this analogy is for laminar flow only. Okay. So very important, this Colbin analogy or all the other analogies for flat plates are not valid for the transition area or for the turbulent flow regime. With the next analogy that we're going to do with the next class, I am going to show you that this analogy is actually also valid in all three flow regimes. So let's use the modified Reynolds analogy. Since the Pranal number is not exactly equal to 1. 
So if the Brownell number was equal to 1, we can use this analogy. If it's larger than 0 0.6, which now we've got 0 0.73, we can actually use. Okay. So this analogy tells us that the skin friction coefficient divided by 2 is equal to the Staunton number. Staunton number. So this is not the thermal boundary layer thickness. It's my S for Staunton number. Prandtl to the two-thirds. Okay. And the Staunton number is equal to the Nusselt number divided by the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. So coming back to this correlation, CF divided by 2 is equal to the Nusselt number divided by the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number Again, Prandtl to the two-thirds. Cf, we already have, is equal to 0 0.00243 divided by 2 is equal to the Nusselt number divided by the Reynolds number, 1.403 multiplied by 10 to the 6. Pranel number 0 0.703, uh, something like that. And then again, Pranel 0 0.703, uh, 0 0.7309 to the 2 thirds. So the only unknown is the Nusselt number, from which we can then solve that the Nusselt number is equal to 1536. And the Nusselt number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the length divided by k. The Nusselt number is 1,536. It's equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the length, which is 3, divided by the thermal conductivity, which is 0 0.025.14, from which we can actually now get the heat transfer coefficient, which is equal to 12.87 watts per meter Kelvin or watts per meter degree Celsius. So we can get the heat transfer coefficients from the fluid, mechanic, fluid mechanics experiments independently. Now suppose, let's make it a little bit real. Suppose the flight plate temperature was 30 degrees Celsius temperature of the surface is 30 and you can go and choose any temperature you want for a plate at a temperature of 50 or whatever ever. then we can say that the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area Ts minus T infinite the surface temperature minus the environment temperature the heat transfer coefficient is equal to 12.87. The surface area, 3 multiplied by 2 is 6 for the front, and then also 6 for the back, it's 12. The surface temperature is 30, minus the free stream temperature, which is 20, and the result is the heat transfer will be 1,544 watts. Nature tells us this analogy between many laws of nature and it shows us how beautiful and fantastic the creation is. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? If not, then thank you. Then we will continue with the next lecture. <laughs>